Hello, my name is Wade Nomura, and this is Rotary and Serving Our Community. One of the opportunities I had uh, today is to actually share with you one of the projects that actually became instrumental in what I do for Rotary now. This model became, a project became a model that we could use and identify a lot of what's happening today. The project itself is uh, Tequena, and it's an island project. What's unique and fascinating about this project, and we'll jump into the pictures right now, is that it's located in Mexico, um, and it, on the map you will see that it is dead center of the Mexico um, country itself. And in this area, um, you'll find a very mountainous area. Most of Mexico is fairly flat. However, in this area, this region, it's very mountainous. The uh, city of Pátzcuaro, which is located in the state of Michoacán, is actually about seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. And what's fascinating also about this um, lake is that the lake is a caldera. In other words, it is naturally formed lake. Geographically, it's identified and located in the um, area as one of the most unique uh, lakes in that area because of the fact that it is at 7,000, 8,000 feet. The islands that it has in there, there are actually four islands. And you'll see the picture here. The island closest to you, the largest one, is the island of Hanizio. Inizio is uh, actually world famous. It's uh, a big party area for the Day of the Dead, November 1st, November 2nd. This place is uh, highly populated. Tourists come from all over the world, actually, to come and see this uh, fascinating uh, venue. Behind it, in the next picture, you will see then the following islands. The first one closest to you is Tequena. Tequena is the project site that we did that we're going to be talking about. Behind it is a flatter island. That island is the island of Yun Wen which is uh, very sparsely populated, but it became an actual resort area. So this resort now is uh, being used by some of the people, but it's not really uh, well that well impacted. Behind it, in the very, very far distance, you will see the island of Paconda. Now, Paconda is very flat, it's very large, and it is the only island that supports and has vehicles on it. It's uh, more of a, I would say, agricultural area, so it's, uh, again, very unique. And uh, this lake, by the way, is very large. It's a, a lake that in square, square miles, square footage is uh, very big. However, it's very shallow. Most areas will only reach about 30 to 40 feet. Some areas, the deepest areas will be maybe only 60 feet deep. And so the um, lake itself recedes and comes up and down quite rapidly because of the fact that it is so shallow. The pictures that, uh, next picture that you see actually is a setting for the launch that we came to. And this picture was taken in 2005 when I actually did the project start of this one. We were looking for uh, water projects and one of the areas that was identified by the Mexican government um, in that area of Michoacan was this island specific because of the fact that they did not have water there. And so when we uh, arrived and saw this, it was such a picturesque area. We, we could not believe how beautiful it was and we looked forward to going out there. The next picture is a picture of the island of Tequena. And uh, in this picture, you will see part of the uh, people living there. The island actually has about 120 inhabitants living there, mostly families, small families. The men, most of the time, are gone. They actually go to the mainland and work. Women and children stay behind because it costs money for them to uh, taxi back and forth. So they usually do stay on the island. It's inhabited by uh, the people, uh, they're Purapechas, they're indigenous people. And fascinating also, because it's an island community, they still speak Purapechan uh, as a language, one of the main languages there, as opposed to Spanish, as most of the area, other areas. The next picture you see, um, I wanted to show you this picture because surrounding this lake is a very uh, geographically interesting area because it's so um, volcanic in, in origin. You could tell right away that it's still pretty young in its infant stages of, uh, I would say, erosion. But the fascinating part is all of the pointed mountains that you'll see there. And you'll also notice the color of the water. That is kind of the natural occurring water color. And again, um, the lake, because it is a naturally occurring caldera, all the water from that entire area all flows into the lake. So the lake itself is grossly contaminated. And one of the reasons why water becomes such an issue on these islands. Now, one of the ways in Probably the only way they get water to this island is by actually trucking it in there or bringing it in by barge. So uh, the cost, as you can imagine, for water was quite expensive. The next picture I have here shows what we were uh, 
met with when we got to the island, you can see the landing itself was in pretty bad shape. There's very few people that go there. Most of the people that are on the island will go back and forth maybe once a week at the most. And again, those are the people working there. So the people would leave on a Monday, come back on a Saturday, Friday or Saturday, back to the families, spend the weekend there, and then again, go back to work again. So um, that is the reason mostly why the um, dock itself is in such bad shape. The next picture uh, shows uh, one of the uh, inhabitants, one of the houses that we have there. And in this house, you'll see that um, it's made of uh, brick and board, very, very rough, very crude. Um, this room that you see, or house that you see, is four walls, a dirt floor, and it is actually the living room, the kitchen, the, the bedrooms, all of the above. And in this small unit here, there are actually six people living in this, uh, this, this little house. Uh, that is part of the issues that we see and we face on these islands is that there's usually very little that people could do to try and elevate their, their living conditions. And so this is one of the reasons why Tequena became one of the ideal spots. The next picture uh, is a picture of the uh, filter that we put in. And I want to share this story with you because this uh, project was met with a number of challenges, a number of turns in the road, starting with water. The first thing we did when we got to um, the Potscoder area, we asked the government which areas were in the most need of water. Well, this island was identified as one. So I talked to the local Rotarians and I asked them if they would be interested in visiting this island with me. The Rotarians that were local said, yeah, we'd be happy to take a look at it. They definitely need water. However, they probably don't want your efforts. In other words, they said they don't want water systems. They like what they've got. They're comfortable. They're um, satisfied. And one of them went as far to say is that in this island, because they're indigenous people, they like the taste of polluted water. And I found that <laughs> definitely to be kind of interesting. Now, what I did was I then went into the research portion of that took a look at it and couldn't find any reason why this would occur. So on a site visit, one of the first questions I posed to them was, would you be interested in having a water system put here where you could actually have safe drinking water as opposed to drinking bought water, which cost an arm and a leg. It was about almost a week's worth of work um, just to get water to the, to the families. Or would you be satisfied with the water that you have? Their answer to me was surprising because they said the same thing. They said, we really don't need your water because we don't like the flavor that filtered water comes with. We prefer to drink the water that we have right now. I asked them uh, where this came from and if there had ever been a water project there before. The answer was yes. About 15, 20 years before I got there, there was a project done by the municipality of um, Pazcuaro. And um, this was a filter system, and I went to go see it. And in looking at it, identifying it, I found it, it was a chlorine injector system. And uh, what I found out through research was that, in fact, that had been abandoned within a year's time. What happened with that injector system in looking at it was the fact that it was not calibrated. That injector system was actually dumping 10 to 100 times more chlorine into the water than was needed. So the people are getting sick from the chlorine, actually um, getting too much chlorine, as opposed to drinking polluted water. That answered the smell, that answered the reason that they were getting sick from filtered water, and it also answered the reason why they did not want to go back to that system. So that was one of the findings that we had. We told them then that we would have a completely different system. This system would be a filtration system done with um, sand, uh, activated sand and charcoal, along with a UV system to help uh, clean up anything else in the water. I asked them if they would be willing to give this a try, as we would be funding it, and if it worked out, then we would figure out a way for uh, maintenance costs for them, and if it didn't work out, we would abandon the project and take the project someplace else. They agreed to that. Um, the first water that we had there, they tasted it, they were all satisfied, they said, this is great, this is uh, our answer to not having to put money now to buy water. We have the water there. Instead of $6 a week, it was gonna cost them only 50 cents a month. So uh, quite the change. About six months later, I went back to see how the system was working and the system was shut down. And I asked them what had happened. Why were they not using the filter system? And they told me that it was because of the fact that I had promised them 50 cents a month 
for, for water. And what they were getting was a bill that was close to $6 a week. And so when I went back to look at the system itself again, I found that the contract that, that had installed this had installed it with a 220 single phase system. And so the electric, electrical prices went skyrocket as opposed to going with the standard 110 home, uh, home voltage. So we switched it out uh, to this day, and this is 2005-2006. Uh, to this day, that system is still in place. The next picture shows actually the, uh, the filter itself, the filter system. You'll see a, a sand, uh, a sand tank. This is activated sand, gravel, um, aggregates itself. Filtration system is going in uh, along with gravel, and these have to be changed out fairly frequently. And one of the reasons why is the well originally was fairly shallow; it was only dug to 40 feet, so they're basically just drawing off lake water. Um, so that was that has to be maintained. That is uh, maintained on a weekly basis by a water committee. Now that has been established on the island. The um, metal unit that you see in the back is actually ultraviolet, it's a UV system. And then you have the carbon uh, filters uh, before the water then exits out into the school area. The next picture I show is a picture of um, one of the groups that I met on the island. This is, uh, these are the indigenous ladies that live on the island pretty much the full time. And the reason that we met with them, we wanted to take a baseline study analysis because we are now going to take a look at maybe uh, moving up the project into different areas, different focuses. What was uh, unique about this project also that I want to share with you is that I was approached by Deepa Willingham who came up and um, Jan Lindsay who came up with this uh, idea of uh, a five-point plan. And that five-point plan is addressing water, health, education, vocational training, and microcredits. And the idea is, is that if we were to focus on these specific five points, we would be able to elevate the living conditions and the, um, the finances, uh, the economics of that specific community by addressing these five points. And so this is why we wanted to do it on the island of Tequena. This actually became the beta site. The alpha site was in India. This became the beta site because we can control the environment. We had a controlled uh, environment because it was an island community. So we started with that, uh, with the five-point plan, because we already had water in place. We then had to look at health, education, vocational training, and the microcredits. So we started with the baseline for the health itself. And uh, the ladies that you see here in this picture, um, we took a look at them as far as their, um, their health and what we had as issues. We found that 25% of the people of this island were suffering from diabetes. And one of the requests that they had was that they could not get enough insulin to that community, even though Hanizio, which was literally about a mile away um, on the lake, would not bring them the supplies that they needed. Even though the government was supplying it to them, it was getting diverted, I would say, out of Hanizio to some other areas. So we looked at that one as uh, a way to then be able to ask the government for assistance. What we found that was quite interesting, very interesting, was the fact that after we put the water system in place, we found that the 25% of diabetics or diabetes in that community dropped substantially, about to half. It was about 12.5 to 13% um, where there would be that many less people suffering from diabetes. Well, what we found out was that with the water system put in place, People were now buying and drinking the water as opposed to, and paying their 50 cents a month, and drinking the water as opposed to drinking sodas, punches, things like that, because we found that the cost of the sodas, the cost of the punches was less than the cost of the water for them, and it tasted better. So they were all drinking soda pop, they were eating candy, um, drinking punch, pretty much everything was sugar in their diets. With the water now set in place, the health had instantly changed, and I found that to be quite fascinating. The um, next picture that you see is uh, a picture of the school, one of the areas of the before shots. This picture shows the school as we saw it on the first day that we got there. The idea was is that this community did not have an area that was that well developed for, I would say, um, schooling, education, um, a, a center. They did not have a clinic there, so we had to address that as one of the potentials to actually have a clinic area there, a first aid system, some place where the community could get together. So this place was identified for that. Now, another one of those turns in the road. When we told them that we were going to address these five points, and we talked about health and having a small, um, I would say, uh, first aid area there, 
they understood that a health or medical clinic was actually going to be a hospital. So they got their hopes up to that we would now be funding a hospital for them on this island. What happened was that they demanded to have, quote, this hospital set in place because we promised it to them. My answer to them at a public meeting was, I'll tell you what, we could do the, uh, we will do and could do this clinic for you, this hospital, and we will have it funded, we will have it staffed for you with nurses, doctors if you need. However, this is gonna set back the five-point plan. In other words, you will focus all of your energy, all of our resources on a clinic, but we will have to then look away from health. We will have to look away from the water needs. We will look away from education, all of the above, but we would give them that clinic. Well, they understood then that it had to be all five. And so they went back and they said, fine, we will go with this five-point plan as you're implementing it. We will take a look at a clinic later. So that's the story behind this school. The next picture that you'll see is actually the finished school. This is the same exact school that you saw in that picture, uh, in the original picture. What we did with uh, the help of an NGO, non-governmental organization, Sinopolis, Sinopolis, who is actually owned by, this company is owned by Dr. Uh, Pablo Ramirez. He's very famous in Mexico, one of the wealthiest people in the Mexico area, and he offered to assist us with the project itself. What's fascinating also is that, as most Rotarians realize, construction cannot be done with funds from that. So in other words, we had to find a separate way, a different way out to finance this project and the build part of it. So what we did was we came up, asked him to do it, and he gladly jumped in there, and we, this is how we built it up. This now became a center for, for food, for meetings, for um, first aid, and also a portion of that became part of the vocational training, as you'll see in some of the future pictures. The next picture shows the, um, the group. This is three years later, what it, what it looks like, and you will see now that visually you could even see that the elevated living is more noticeable. People are living better, their health is better, they dress nicer, um, and there's a lot more people going to school because now they understand that part of the component of education. The next picture uh, is a picture of that deck. Now, if you recall, one of the first pictures I showed you was that picture of the dock itself as we landed. Well, this is what you're greeted with now. This became an, an overflow area. It will be uh, an area where we will receive, or they will receive, tourists, tourism, people like that, that would come in here and actually enjoy the island for what it is because the idea is, is that we would then build up tourism on this as a way for financing. The next picture shows the kitchen. It's actually a commercial kitchen that we installed in there also with this project. Uh, the gentleman in the center, uh, Jose Luis Adame, lives in Pátzcuaro. And uh, he is a uh, person that does... Um, tablecloths, things like that, uh, outstanding. And it's, by the way, it's three generations old as far as the way he's still doing it. It's still done all on a hand loom. But uh, he was one of the people instrumental in doing this project for us because he was an on-site person. The next picture shows uh, some of the nutritional components. This uh, kitchen actually now serves the children of that community. And so each day during school, five days a week, they're given a one balanced meal at least in the morning. And it's something that they never had before. The food itself was actually funded by a government grant from the government of uh, Mexico, but it is now being administered by the um, school and also by the people that live there, the community people. So um, again, one of the parts of health that now is being addressed. The next picture shows what's inside. Uh, again, there's a organized uh, area inside seating for the public to meet and greet. This is our team. I have uh, Debbie Murphy, who was on the show previously, my wife Roxanne, and David Vo, who at that time was a uh, rotor actor, uh, went as a young professional, has now since joined Rotary. Um, this is a team we went through and we, we evaluated, took uh, information down, surveyed them, and did an analysis of how they're living now. Another interesting story, by the way, that comes out of this uh, as far as a needs assessment, because we do a needs assessment now for every project that we do for Rotary. One of the projects that we um, had somebody jump into on the island of Tequena was a swimming lesson or a swim, swim school for the kids. 
The idea was is that since this is an island community, we wanted to make sure that the children were safe. So we funded a, a swimming teacher, swimming instructor, and we actually constructed um, a pool made out of rock that would be safe right off, side, uh, right off the island so they could walk into the water, the shallow water, and would be safe because we can keep them in this confined area. What we found um, a few months later was that nobody was taking those swimming lessons. We had funded this for a one-year program. Nobody was there. Needs assessment was not done. And what happened was is that we found out that the kids quit going because that lake was so grossly contaminated, they were all going home and getting sick. So they quit giving those swimming lessons. No brainer. Now, had we done a needs assessment, we would have realized that that was something that was going to just not work out for us. The next picture shows one of the ladies and a daughter there, um, one of the very happy people. They uh, are doing quite well. She told us that, you know, thank you very much for changing lives because now she has what she needs. She has food. She has a nicer place to live. Her daughter's getting educated. Is there five, six days a week at the school? The next picture shows a sewing machine, and this was part of the vocational training that we did. We originally planned on investing in about 15 sewing machines and finding somebody in Pascoe area that would be willing to finance this project. Well, I believe right now we uh, have converted that. We still have the one or two uh, sewing machines, but we have now converted that to actually being a computer center. So um, that's being used for education. The picture that you see next is uh, the playground. One of the areas that helped out a lot was having this playground covered. Uh, this used to be an open area, and you can see the money now coming forward, the financing, the understanding of that. The next picture is, the, is a picture of the island of Henizio. This is the neighboring island, and this one is the one I told you about that is uh, very well-to-do, very prosperous. Um, it is actually a tourist uh, area, so one of the reasons for that. We anticipate that with the smaller scale that Tacoina is, is that we could now use that Henizio as kind of a landing area and move people back and forth between the two communities uh, should we decide to do tourism as one of the primaries. The next picture you see is, um, that's Tacoina in the background. In the foreground are the uh, butterfly nets that these people use. And they've been using this for, for generations. And they do a show like this. And I asked them because, uh, Again, it's, it's based on tourism. They do this. They have one gentleman circle the boat uh, with that boat, and he actually has his hat you know, out, and he's asking for donations as we take pictures of these people. Um, to be honest with you, I was there for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. I didn't see a single fish come out of any of those nets, but we, we paid the price for the show. Interesting is the next picture, um, even though I didn't see any fish coming out of it, this is uh, one of the vendors on the local island. He's selling a small fish, very small white fish. It looked to be like large minnows, things like that. Deep fried, um, you buy these as treats. Now, we asked, I'm sorry, I had one of our friends ask for carnitas. He went to the restaurant, asked for carnitas. He was uh, instantly handed one of these. He goes, well, this is meat. This is what you ordered. So um, we, we actually tried it. It wasn't bad. We figured that if you eat something fried, pretty much it's kind of got to be kind of safe. And at least it tastes okay. So we tried it. It wasn't bad, but I don't think I'd pay for a meal from them. <laughs> the next picture um, actually shows the school itself and the way it looks today. As you can see from previous, where you just had a, a board up kind of uh, living condition, a school that was on stilts. Now you see we have the tourism coming in, you have the barges, you have all of the above. This is the change. This occurred within five, six years. And this is the focus of that. As, as I told you before, the five-point plan of water, health, education, vocational training, um, and microcredit was the model that we created. What came out of that was the Rotary Foundation, Rotary International, the foundation of Rotary International, actually then from that developed what is now being used as the six areas of focus. We have water and sanitation, child and maternal health, basic education, disease prevention, community and economic development, and peace and conflict resolution. Now, if you look at that list, you'll note five of those are almost identical to our five-point plan. And this was, in fact, not a coincidence. The model that we created actually was being used as part of the model for the new six areas of focus that Rotary is using today. And I wanted to share that with you because one of the fascinating points of this project was that if we were to address all five, 
In other words, right now we have the six areas of focus. But if you were to address all five areas or all six areas of focus, you would be able to uh, elevate any community that is living in poverty up at least one, two levels next. Now, if, if you think about that, um, one of the components I think that becomes crucial for Rotary is that we have to now focus in specifically on not just going in with one project, addressing one area of focus at a time. We are gonna to have to take a look at all of the areas and see, in fact, which steps we're gonna take. Because it's not just one area we should be touching. It should be a step or sequence into the next series. The last picture I wanted to show you is the island of Tequena today. And as you recall, the first pictures I showed you, they were living in board huts, uh, plastic roofs. Some of them were made out of um, adobe or mud from the um, actual lake itself. This is what it looks like today. You'll see that the, uh, the housing has become a lot better, substantially improved. The people now are living much more comfortably than before. They are no longer restricted to being just on the island. They can move around back and forth. And that is one of the areas where I think we could see it. We could see the difference. Now, what Rotary focuses on is changing people's lives. I know this show is called Rotary Serving Our Community, and some of you are thinking, well, what does this international effort have to do with our community? These models are set in place. We are going from one extreme to the other and seeing the changes, seeing the difference. This model could also be used in any community, the community in Santa Barbara, community in Carpinteria, community in Goleta, where we could address all of these issues and also elevate lives because we have a middle class, we have those that are doing well, but we also have, unfortunately, a vast majority of people or a lot of people living still in a poverty level. That shouldn't happen, that shouldn't occur. So we take a look at this. This model now could be implemented anywhere in the world, including in developed countries. So with that, uh, I did wanna share this with you. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about my past experiences because of this one specific project. This project was one that changed my life. This project also was one that has changed Rotary. With that, everybody, thank you very much for your time. Take a look at all the projects and see how this specific project has changed Rotary completely and the world. Thank you, we'll see you next time.